John Palmer and Stan Hieronymus join us for a very special episode number 200 Q&A session. This is Beer Smith Podcast number 200. This is Beer Smith Podcast number 200 and it's late September 2019. My good friends John Palmer and Stan Hieronymus are here for a Q&A session to celebrate a very special 200th episode. Well, I'm going to thank my regular sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine and Blickman Engineering. I'm going to skip the sponsored messages this week so you can enjoy a commercial-free show. What I do want to do is thank each of you for making nine years of the Beersmith Podcast possible. I published episode number one on the 15th of October, 2010, and I never imagined we'd still be doing this almost nine years later. Uh, we've also had almost six million downloads in that period. I've got two of my very good friends on today for episode number 200. John Palmer and I have enjoyed a number of adventures together, including a trip to Brazil, fishing in North Carolina, a week-long homebrew video shoot, and countless beer events. Uh, Stan also joined us in Brazil a few years back uh, at the Harley-Davidson Museum in Milwaukee, and uh, also dozens of beer events. Both of them I, I very much enjoy, and it's great to have them today on the show. I'm happy to have them both here for episode number 200, and now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome our special episode number 200 guests, John Palmer and Stan Hieronymus. John is the top-selling beer brewing author in the world, of course, with How to Brew, uh, and he first appeared on the show way back in episode number three in November of 2010. He was also on us for episode number 100 in March of 2015. Uh, Stan Hieronymus is one of the nation's top authorities on hops and author of the book Hops, as well as Brew Like a Monk and many others. Uh, while Stan didn't join us until episode number 37, he does have the distinction of having appeared 10 times on the show. It's great to have you on the show, John. Great to have you back. Thank you. Great to be here. And of course, Stan, uh, wonderful to have you here for this special show. Always my pleasure, uh, with the exception maybe of the fourth time I was on. That was a little ugly. but The fourth I time, recovered. yeah. I, 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 the details have totally gone away. I'll have, have to go look that one. one up, I guess. <laughs> Fourth one. That would have been in the mid, mid seventies, probably, or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, well, John, uh, I want to get your thoughts on reaching episode number 200 and, uh, being on the show for nine years now, I think. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's surprising that we're still clinging, uh, to fame, but, um, yeah, on the other hand, you know, the fact that you have reached 200 episodes and, you know, uh, every time I'm talking with uh, brewers at conferences, you know, Beersmith is like the standard that they refer to when they talk about, you know, adjusting their recipes and, and uh, you know, doing any kind of uh, documentation of their recipes. It's always on Beersmith. So you've made quite the impact as well. Well, thank you, John. I appreciate that. Um, Stan, what are your thoughts on, uh, episode number 200 and, uh, uh, having appeared, let's see, 10 times now? Um, I must be having a good time. I didn't realize it was 10 times. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think this, this sort of helps answer a question you have, uh, for us later about the health of homebrewing. Yeah. Uh, you you, if beer smith's going this good, if, if John and I obviously must be eating pretty well and getting a fair amount of beer, um, there has to be a fair amount of interest in home brewing uh, ongoing. Yeah, I think we're doing okay. Uh, actually, the podcast hit 5.9 million downloads, I think, or something like that. So not too bad. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, pretty good. So um, today we're going to do a little Q&A uh, on some random brewing topics and questions that I often get. And I'm going to throw the first one out to Stan. And I know you guys have uh, have several things to talk about here. Because you sent me some notes, but um, yeah. Stan, why are why are the measured IBUs from a test often so different than the IBU estimates you get from a model like Tinseth or Reger or any of those other ones? Well, one thing to think about is the IBU uh, is that formula is a compromise uh, that was made about sixty years ago. Hops were a lot different then. The way brewers use hops are a lot different now. Uh, so. If you went back and were to, to brew beers that were more common, uh, we'll call them classic styles, in uh, the 90s, 
yeah. using whole leaf hops, not dry hopping, not having above 40 IBU, you would find those formulas still work pretty well. Um, but, but important thing to remember that that's as these things have happened is people have the goal of that formula was to say that one IBU sensory wise was comparable to one uh, milligram per liter of iso alpha acids. And it, it tried to take into account that how hops were going to age and how they were going to be used. And, and that's changed. Um, I'll, John has given this a lot of thought, and it seems fair enough to let him talk about some of those changes. Okay, over to you, John. Ah, well, okay. Um, yeah, so the the IBU test, as Stan said, you know, invented back in the 50s, um, it measures the absorption, the light, the how much light a sample of of beer absorbs at um, 275 nanometers or whatever that number is. And what it is doing is it's they, they do a solvent extraction on the beer to capture all of the hop bitter compounds. Um, principally, uh, they were interested in the iso, the, the iso alpha acids. But it also captures other chemically similar compounds in this solvent extraction. And uh, they said, okay, most of what we're cap capturing is the iso alpha. Let's um, take that absorption test reading and multiply it by 50, and that is our IBUs. And as Stan said, it was it was pretty comparable back then. Uh, also, given the fact that the kind of beer that they were measuring was pretty commonly an American light lager. Um, these days, of course, we're brewing you know every beer style under the sun. Um, we're doing late hopping, whirlpool hopping, dry hopping, and the uh, the proportions of the compounds uh, from the hops that are being added to the beer are also shifting. So um, while many brewers complain that you know the IPU is obsolete, the IB test IB test is not relevant. Um, I think if you understand what it is that it's measuring, um, it, it is still relevant and still useful information. Hmm. I just want to add something too. I had Glenn Tinseth on actually way back for the first uh, season of Beersmith. I think it was in 2010. And of course, Glenn Tinseth is author of the Tinseth equation. And he mentioned that, you know, he developed the equation really to just use on one set of equipment that he was using at the time. Um, and it wasn't even meant to be general application. So I, I, you know, I want, I want what your thought, what's your thoughts on that, Stan? Well, it was a one barrel system. Yeah. So it was neither <laughs> big nor small. Uh, he was working with leap ops. Um, you know, he, he, I don't think he had a great measure of, uh, how his utilization would be different. He didn't have much to compare it to. And, and the key for that, you think about how, as a brewer, you want to use uh, IBU. And again, in the 90s, brewers weren't making, uh, releasing three or four new brands every week. Um, they were making like four or five different beers during the course of a year. And they were trying to make sure they were the same from one, one batch to another. So you knew exactly how your system was working. You had a good idea of what your utilization is. So if one batch of uh, Cascade came in at seven and a half alpha and your previous batch was six alpha, you could use that formula um, to make a beer that tasted the same as before. Um, and I, I don't think that anybody envisioned that we would uh, be dry hopping like we do now, like John pointed out. So that gives you a, a different hop compound that you're measuring. Um, it, the, it, it's reading as the same number, but these oxidized uh, compounds, which are only getting to beer when you dry hop, have a different sort of bitterness. Uh, in addition, for instance, if you use cinnamon in beer, cinnamon also will measure 
uh, the same way as those alpha acids or those iso alpha acids. Uh, curiously enough, in the case of cinnamon, it, it, it in beer it often comes off as bitter, just like hop bitterness. Um, I, I'm no, I'm not sure I've seen a good measure of IBU in pumpkin beers, but again, if if people are actually using pumpkin flesh, that probably uh, messes with the uh, IBU as well. So it's a it's a complicated picture there, huh? But, but when you're making the same beer time after time, it is a useful tool. It's probably one that brewers should have never spoken of outside the brewery, um, but now it's happened. <laughs> Um, and, and unfortunately, uh, sometimes uh, I'm not sure what terminology we should use on a family podcast, but it does uh, give you many brewers an opportunity to strut their manliness. Ah, uh, there you go. <laughs> Actually, that, and that yep. brings up a related question. Uh, I think we've talked about this a couple times on the show, but there, you know, there is a limit to what you can taste, right, in terms of IBUs? I, I actually, John's got some, uh, you know, the latest, uh, I mean, there's a limit to how much just, IBUs we can actually, everything, everything beyond a certain level just tastes bitter, right? John? But, uh, there are two parts. First of all, how much you can actually will remain in the beer. And that is generally a higher level than the German uh, flavor scientists uh, have found, which is your, that's probably what they think you really can't distinguish above anything above 70 IBU. Yeah, your thoughts, uh, your thoughts, John. Did you have you said something? Well, um, yeah, some of the recent work uh, in the last couple of years have uh, demonstrated uh, threshold perception of the individual compounds, the iso alpha acids, the uh, oxy alpha or humulinones, and the uh, the oxy beta, the the hulipones. And those are generally 5 to 6 ppm for the iso-alpha and 7 to 8 ppm uh, for the humulinones and hulipones. But there also seems to be that upper limit where um, beyond, say, 100 IBUs, uh, you really can't cram any more you know, hop compounds into solution. Um, there's like a solubility limit. And beyond that, everything just sticks to the walls of the fermenter or the boil kettle and the trube and everything else that there is to stick to. You're just, um, I mean, just, just adding more vegetal matter at that point almost. Yeah. And actually taking a, a lot away because um, uh, Aaron Justice of uh, Ballast Point did a really interesting paper last year where he demonstrated in, at Ballast Point how the effect of hopping rate has a significant impact on utilization. That is, the more hops that you put into a beer, the less effective it is in terms of uh, generating actual bitterness and, uh, and hop aroma and flavor. So much of the, the hop compounds, the, uh, the, you know, the alpha acids, the oxy and iso that you're trying to add to the beer and the oils end up sticking to all this green matter that you know, and trube uh, that's in the in the wort, um, and so you have just diminishing returns as you increase hopping rate. And that kind of makes sense if there's a solubility limit. Obviously, as you get close to that limit, less and less is going to go into solution, right? Yeah. yeah, the actual number, you know, maybe 92, 95, but we we are just kind of looking at 100, 100 as a easy to so remember around a, number. Around 100 IBUs, yeah. Yeah. Well, John, I want to go to another topic. Um, there's been a lot of ink spilled on uh, adjusting water profiles over the years for all grain brewing, but um, I often get the question: how, how do you adjust your water if you're an extract brewer? Well, you're an, if you're an extract brewer, um, you know that extract is simply a dehydrated wort. So, you know, when that wort was created, water adjustment was done. Um, that water had, you know, a certain mineral uh, composition that the brewmaster felt was uh, appropriate for that uh, malt extract or that that wort that he was making. Um, and when that extract is concentrated, either into a liquid extract or dry, um, all of those minerals are still there. So if you're extract brewing, I think as a first cut. You should do. You should use distilled water or reverse osmosis water, or you know that is a very low mineral water, 
to rehydrate that extract with. Um, and then as you brew that recipe once or twice and understand how it tastes, then you could look at maybe adding some calcium sulfate to accentuate the hoppiness or add some calcium chloride to accentuate the maltiness. You know, that's your sulfate to chloride ratio type adjustments. Mm. Good. Um, well, Stan, I get a lot of questions from homebrewers looking to scale their recipes up uh, to pro batch sizes. There's a lot of pro brewers or people going pro from the homebrew scene. Um, what are the main differences between, you know, going to a multi-barrel beer and a homebrewed beer uh, is that that hop utilization changes often by quite a bit. Why, what, what is the main cause of this? And, and can you help folks understand that? But I, um, in a way, John uh, answered that question earlier when we, we were talking about density. Um, so the size of the kettle and, and the reason it makes a difference is you've got a uh, different surface area. Um, so you think about during the proving process, why you ended up, I mean, and our home brewer would probably be delighted with that, uh, with 25% utilization, you're losing about half of the ISO, uh, post boil, either in the tube or when you're actually taking, you know, the hops that are, have been in solution out when you're transferring it. So now you're down to 50%. And then you lose about another 50% of that during fermentation. So that, that's where you're losing the ISO. And, and the, the factors there can be uh, the original gravity, as we know. That's some of those things you can take into account just as uh, professional brewers do. Um, at that hopping rate, uh, your yeast choice, and, and things like that. But your the two parts about a homebrew kettle, it's smaller. It's also shaped a little bit different. So you're going to get um, a little more, it's hotter at the bottom. So the hydrostatic pressure's a bit different. There have been some studies that are looking like what's the best level of pressure uh, to get uh, maximum uh, utilization. And you're more likely to get that in a commercial brewery as well, which are, are set up for that. So th the, the differences are you, you can literally say that size is the biggest factor in there. So you get, uh, I mean, a typical, you know, maybe a five barrel system is going to get what percentage more utilization? Um, I know it's hard to say, but you're like 150, 130. No, no, more, more like even, even the difference. I mean, you at a homebrew system, and I don't know many homebrewers that have actually had their IBU measured, uh, but I think you can get uh, in the mid in, in the between say 15 and 17 percent yeah um and you're probably gonna those commercial breweries even at a 10 barrel brewery that they're happy getting 23 25 percent so it's not that humongously different well um, I'm, I'm saying relative to the homebrew scale it is it is quite a bit different because you well, go from 17 to yeah 17 yeah, to it, 23 it, it, or whatever it, that's it, a, uh, almost 50 percent that's like a 50 percent so it's about 150 percent difference uh 150 percent scale up i guess so um, um yeah so the, but a simple solution is to use more hops but of course when you use more hops as john pointed out then your your utilization is going to go down and, yeah. and you also really need to take into account understand you know if, if you're at altitude that's changing your utilization um, making sure your ph is right that's changing your utilization there are all these other factors that the home brewers won't necessarily take into account yeah um well going on to mash ph john what's the best way to adjust your mash ph given that uh, a lot of these high enzyme malts that we have today uh most of the base malts actually can convert the sugars in a very short amount of time often before we really get a good ph measurement so i mean you're you're you're, you're mashing in you're starting to measure your ph and is it too late already well it can be um the the i i guess the interesting wrinkle to this uh question is that um, generally people's pHs are higher than what the the, the uh, suggested target is. We talk about a suggested target range of uh, 5.2 to 5.6. And if you have alkaline brewing water, uh, 
or um, you're not adding a lot of uh, specialty malts to your brew or acid malt or doing acid adjustment, generally your pH is going to be high. It'll be in that 5, 6 to 6.0 range, right. um, which for starch conversion is actually good. I mean, this, the, the amylases tend to work quite well in that range. The downside to that is that you, that's where you also start running into tannin and, ex, and silicate extraction problems from the husks. So your beer could be a little bit more astringent at those um, at those pHs. Right. Um, the nice thing is um, acid adjustment, such as lactic acid or phosphoric acid, um, does work fairly quickly. I say within ten minutes or so. Um, so if you if you dough in, you measure your pH, you stir really well, measure your pH, and it's high, then you can often add acid and, you know, within 10, 15 minutes, maybe you're looking at, say, 20 minutes total into the mash, uh, the, the pH has come down to uh, the more of the target level. And that will help smooth out the flavor of your beer, help your beer clarity, and a few things like that. Uh, if it's the opposite, um, where the pH is too low, uh, mash pH is very difficult to raise. And then that case, I say, well, you know, try again next time, adjust your water, uh, add more bicarbonates to the water, you know, such as baking soda, get that dissolved ahead of time and then mash in with that. And, uh, with, with your, your dark malts and so on that caused your pH to be low in the first place. And that should balance it out and you should be, uh, you know, more within the target. Now, what do you think about the strategy of trying to add some of the acid right up front? You know, you know using software well, or something like that to do an estimate and then uh, maybe add a portion of the acid up front before you mash in. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, you know, if you if you want to bring your pH down, yeah, that's a good way to go. And that is very easy to do with software, um, provided you know uh, what the mineral composition of your water is. Let's say you have 100 ppm of total alkalinity is calcium carbonate. Well, then you can you know, input that to brewing software such as Beersmith and calculate a precise amount of acid to add for uh, your, vo your water volume. And that will you know, completely eliminate uh, that, cal that carbonate uh, number. Yeah, I mean, um, usually so what, yeah, I, that's, what I'll do, for example, is, is add a portion of that acid up front to get down in that range, you know, and then maybe do a final yeah. adjustment after I've mashed in and, and, and able to get an accurate measurement, you know? Yeah, add half or 75% of the, your total acid calculation and see what you get and then add the rest if it's needed. Yeah, good. that's a good strategy. Okay. Um, well, Stan, we're seeing a bunch of beers advertised now that are triple hop, double dry hop, triple dry hopped, and all these other kinds of crazy things. What do these really mean? Is this, is this just marketing uh, speak or what? Well, it's not just marketing. Well, in some cases, it is just marketing. Uh, the triple hop thing, I assume you're referring to something from a large international brewer, um, and that means they add hops at three different times. Um you know, in the case of one large international brewer that sometimes refers to their beers as triple hopped, um, they're actually using uh, CO2 extract on all three editions of the hops. So <laughs> it doesn't seem like it's a hop rich beer. Um, now, when it comes to the whatever in dry hopping, whether it's double dry hopped or triple dry hopped, people could be clear what they're doing. Um, it's been, oh, Firestone Walker, for instance, um, well, Pliny the Elder uh, for a long time has been dry hopped at two different times. And in that case, Vinny Russo took what he was going to dry hop with, split it into two, uh, dry hop seven days in and two weeks in. Um, at uh, Firestone Walker, uh, Matt Brindle said did much the same thing when they were developing Union Jack, although the dry hopping times are much shorter. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 now, of course, people are dry hopping at day one, or or, or sometimes even uh, earlier, um, 
but uh, and then say at day four, and, and they're doing that in order to to maximize um, what they are getting in terms of biotransformations, which becomes a whole different subject, which we've talked about before. Uh, yeah, I and, mean, what the, you're, you're talking about hopping during active fermentation, right? Right. To get yeah. some of these tropical flavors right. and so and, on. And generally, and, and, and the other reason, like Matt's description before, of course, is if you take half of the hops and dry hopping, then and they're passing through the beer, and then the other half, you're, you, you've got better opportunity to absorb the oils. So that's why you would dry hop two times for that. Uh, you would dry hop two times so you get a biotransformation early, some oils late, for instance. Now, of course, when they say double dry hopped or triple dry hopped, it may mean twice the amount of hops that they used to use. or uh, and, and so it could be twice the amount of hops, the, the same amount of hops in the first edition, the same amount they used to use in the second edition. So people haven't really explained this. And certainly you've seen a shift um, – if I look back to say 2010, a panel at the Craft Brewers Conference, and everybody agreed that they were getting diminishing returns at one half pound per barrel, which is less than two grams per liter. Uh, so in uh, in a homebrew batch of beers, that that would be less than 20 grams. And and now uh, people are accepting the idea that they're going to uh, dry hop. Uh, uh, a recent study at Oregon State University says, geez, you, you're, you really shouldn't go beyond two pounds per barrel, which is four times that amount. Um, and many people are doing four pounds per barrel or six pounds per barrel. So the amounts have gone way, way up. And I mean, six pounds per barrel is a crazy amount of hops, right? Um, th th there are some of us who think so, yes. That's uh, I'm trying to remember several ounces per gallon, basically, right? Uh, well, let's see. Uh, six pounds per barrel would be uh, twenty-two grams per liter. Um, how many grams in an ounce? Let's see, uh, twenty-seven. <laughs> yeah. Um, trying to do math yeah, on TV. Like that. Here. That's about right. Oh. Um, yeah. So, one pound yes. per gallon, or yeah, one pound per barrel is. Four grams per liter is about right. a half ounce per gallon. Right. Um, those yeah. so rough numbers. It's, yeah, those it it is a, a crazy large amount. Um, so it's it's not totally true, and it is changing the beer. People do generally like the aroma. We could go back and talk about all the things. One of the things when John was talking about um, that wasn't always considered. Uh, it, we know adds to bitterness is polyphenols. So you're adding more polyphenols, for instance. Um, and what also happens is when you dry up those levels, uh, your, those, those humulinones, which are um, oxidized alpha acid compounds, they have a different sort of bitterness. And when you add all that green matter, you, in fact, are going to pull some of the isoalpha acids that you've got in the boil out of solution. And and you're going to replace that with a different sort of bitterness. And mm. and some people really uh, like that um, um, less bitter bitterness. The I guess you call it. Yeah. Well, the oxy If, I, alpha. if yeah. I did the math right here, six pounds six pounds per uh, barrel turns out to be uh, over 13 ounces in a five gallon batch. So that's yep pretty substantial amount yeah. of dry hops. You're, you're, when you dry hop, it will look quite green. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, well, John, uh, can you give us your thoughts on the judicious use of crystal malts? I know uh, some beginners uh, use uh, almost every, use it in every recipe and uh, even many recipes where it's not appropriate. So how do we yeah. uh, avoid the crystal malt trap, particularly some of the harsh flavors you can get? Yeah, I, I guess I have, I'm a... Uh former proponent of that school that added crystal malt to everything. But, uh, you know, as you probably remember, when we started homebrewing, there really wasn't much else to choose from. You had base or you had crystal. Um, you also had a little bit of Munich, but, uh, uh, but anyway, getting back to the question. Yeah. Uh, 
you want to kind of think in like 3D malt space when it comes to your uh, grains. And so you have your base malt and that's, you know, 75, 90% of your grain bill. The crystal malts, of course, add more residual sugars, more dextrins. Uh, They also add key flavor components, you know, your light crystals, 20 lova bonds, kind of honeyish, 40 lova bond, a little bit toffee-ish, uh, 60 lova bond, more caramel, um, 80, you're going towards that dark caramel. Um, and, you know, as you go up to 90 and 100, now you're getting to kind of like a, a burnt marshmallow kind of yeah, I think uh, uh, Randy, Randy Mosher talks about the harsh zone, which is kind of around 70 love a bond or so. It starts to get really harsh, yeah. kind of burnt. And in fact, they don't even make a lot of malts uh, between roughly 70 and 200, I think it is. Right. Yeah, that is that is true. And so, but the the, the key thing to keep in mind is that as, as you're designing a recipe and trying to include uh, you know, a little residual sweetness and a little bit of, you know, not so much sweetness as some flavor character is, uh, you know, keep, keep this uh, balanced. Um, you still want the beer to attenuate fully. Otherwise, the beer becomes too filling and it becomes difficult to drink a whole pint of it. And that's the drinkability aspect. Um, if you're looking for more malt flavor, then I suggest you look at the Munich and Vienna malts because those have been kilned a little bit higher than base malt, and they add some more of this maltiness that you get from, you know, um, home baked bread, you know, uh, bread crust kind of character. Not sweet, but richer. So. Um, yeah, to to avoid overusing crystal malts, uh, I would also suggest adding portions of of Munich malts or something like the Acara aroma, where you're adding multi, you know, deep multi flavor with but without sweetness, and that'll help round out that whole malt character without becoming overly sweet. And uh, Stan, I don't think I've ever done an episode on recipe design with you. Uh, what are your thoughts on this topic? Um, it, it, I would have said, is that a trick question? Cause I don't use crystal malts. You, um, you don't use them at all, huh? <laughs> Not an English beer. Uh, I, I, yeah, I uh, use them for English beers. English, a, it's, so uh, one thing to think about is the difference between English crystal and American crystal, which is softer. Um, particularly if you stay at the, at the lower level bonds. And I, I do. And in fact, I, I think, um, English crystal malts can work well in uh, say a Belgian double, as a matter of fact. So that if you think about it, each side of the Atlantic, and it didn't, and there are some beers I really like. Obviously, Sierra Nevada does make some wonderful beers with crystal malt. Uh, but now closing in on 25 years ago, uh, when I first had Victory Hop Devil IPA, and that was just right. a wow beer. And you go, you know, what's different about it? And you realize that that you had this nuance. Um, it, it had color, but it had this nuance, and it it didn't have that sweetness. Um, and it had a few things going on that that were different. It wasn't like in in the mid '90s, you had a lot of crystal malt and a lot of Chinook that was Chinook has some really nice qualities and, and when people are using it and and uh, allowing those hops to get uh, the bio transformations take place it adds um some uh, fruitiness to it but if you're just using the dry hop you're getting a lot of pine and you just got that pine and crystal together was kind of harsh and victory was entirely different and at that point for color malt that that's when he switched to uh, munich eight um and and that's where the little color and texture and a bit of sweetness came from. Uh, as a matter of fact, then I just started using all continental uh, barley varieties in an IPA. It seemed sort of counterintuitive um, for an American IPA, but it just suited my palate. And um, you know, additionally, now when you think about, I, I when I talk to people about recipes, uh, more often than not, they're they're Belgian. Um, inspired beers and they don't use crystal malt either interesting 
So, uh, so how long have, how long have you been brewing without crystal malt, then, Stan? Uh, I'm uh, more than twenty years. Twenty years. I, I wish not to say never use crystal malt, uh, but you want to use crystal malt at the time that it's that it's simply adding uh, nuance. So you just went cold turkey, though. Yeah. Well, it's you know, <laughs> yeah. I probably I, another key thing I think in deciding what uh, malts to use in beer. Uh, eating them is not the way to go. Um, like I fell in love with Special B the first time I could taste Special B, and then I made these beers with lots of Special B in them. And boy, were they horrible! Not a good thing, though. No. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, John and Stan, I wanted to get your thoughts. Uh, I'll, I'll ask John first, I guess. But uh, on the huge array of new hop products coming out, uh, you know, there's no, there's CO two hop extracts. There's cryo hops, which I believe are lupulin powder. There's uh, all kinds of hop oil extract coming in. I mean, you now get individual hop oils even, uh, or, or individual varieties of hop oils. Um, John, what are your thoughts on uh, some of these new things coming out? Well, you know, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I was just up at the uh, Yakima, um, Yakima Chief Hop and Brew School, and uh, these products are a result of, you know, American craft brewers looking to pump ever more hop flavor and aroma into their IPAs, you know, trying to really, you know, densify that hop character in their beers. And uh, so in the case of, you know, the uh, cryo hops or lupulin powder, you know, where they enrich uh, the, the hop pellet with uh, and concentrate the lupulin in that pellet, um, yeah, you can use those to um, to add, you know, more uh, hop character to the beer than you would get from, um, you know, a T ninety pellet alone. Keep in mind what we were saying earlier. You know that every time you try to add hops, um, a lot of it's going to end up sticking to that green matter and the trube that's in your in your kettle. Well, and that's where these uh, concentrated hop products can help is because you're reducing the amount of green matter that's going into the kettle. Well, the other, the other so thing you, I like to, I like to point out is that aromatic oils by their nature are not very soluble because if they were soluble, right. you wouldn't smell them at you all. Wouldn't. Right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So yeah, I mean the, these, the hop oils, the CO2 extracts, the cryo hops, all of these are tools that a brewer can use to help try to, you know, get more hop character into their beers. Um, but, you know, there are trade-offs um, and, it, it, you know, you have to kind of experiment and find what works for your recipe. Stan, uh, over to you. Well, um, a, a couple things about that, what you're going to, uh, many of these products are, are more suited for uh, the commercial breweries and, and a larger mm. brewery. Certainly cryo hops are an exception um, particularly when they put them in pellet form and home brewers could get them. So as John pointed out, if you're using them, uh, uh, you can get better utilization with them. Uh, but additionally, uh, there's some thinking that the enzymes that are uh, causing hop creep are in the green matter. Uh, so that's another reason in your uh, dry hopping to use some combination of the cryo and, and maybe – some of the pellets as well, and yeah, it's going to cut. I, down I had you on talk. About, I had you yeah. on talking about hop creep a while ago, but can you mention right. what that is, just for folks that may oh, not have uh, heard about uh, it? Hop, hop creep is there are enzymes in the hops um, that are going to convert what's left uh, in what's actually finished beer into sugar. Uh, if you have yeast present, <clears throat> the yeast then are going to start to to eat that. And if you then cool those your beer down before the uh, diacetyl is uh, removed, you're going to get a, a butter bomb beer. Uh, even if 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 you removed all the yeast, say I mean homebrewers aren't going to do this, but if you like even filter it out your yeast, it's going to continue to convert that into sugar. So if you're aging beer, for instance, uh, it's going to lose body. And it's going to pick up the sugar. So y your goal is to have less of that enzymatic activity. You can deal with the diacetyl with the good long diacetyl rest and things like that. Uh, but but the more you 
leave in there. So wh why is this happening now and it hasn't happened before? That's still a bit of a mystery, but there's a lot of thinking as you denatured those enzymes during the kilning process and now we are not denaturing those because people are kilning at lower temperatures to give you more oils. And then of course, back to the idea people never dry hopped at these levels. Um, uh, and the last time I said that, Ron Pattinson yep. pointed out to me that there are historically there were some things going on uh, in kegs, but th those were not the majority of the beers. Well, and the and the the hop creep is very closely tied to these very high drop dry hop levels, right? Uh, exactly. If you, if you, it, it, uh, otherwise, it, it's not an issue. Yeah, because you're certainly denaturing those enzymes during the boil. And I uh, also want to get your thoughts on these new individual hop oils. I know you can buy now little drops that, uh, you know, it will give you a, the, the hop oils from a particular variety or even individual hop oils, if you like. Well, the, the, the tricky parts of that are hard because some are extracted and some are distilled. Uh, the distilled, to me, smell more, more natural. And then when, when you add them, is a factor as well. If, if they're integrated within beer, then it, it it just seems more natural to me. If it's just like a perfume, um, then not so much. Hmm. Well, um, Stan, uh, moving on to another topic, uh, and you talked about this at the very beginning, but um, the homebrew market has been in decline for many years, uh, for, by many accounts, since somewhere around 2012, 2013. Um, what do you think it's going to take to turn things around? Well, I'm, I'm not sure what in decline means. <laughs> um, well, I mean, you look at sales, there... sales have been declining roughly 4% a year in some yeah. cases more. If you're, if you own a small, uh, uh homebrew shop, it's been quite a bit more actually. Right. Uh, the, certainly there are fewer homebrew shops. Um, and it does seem like, but, but are fewer people brewing? Are they just brewing less? Um, uh, I, uh, membership, the AHA is down a little bit. Um, I don't know where there are lots of people who are not members of, uh, the AHA, uh, is, is that down as well? I'm, I'm not quite sure. I, what, what struck me this year at homebrew con was paying attention to the equipment that's being sold. Um, and, and at a certain high end, people are you buying really nice equipment, um, beats the heck out of my got cooler. Um, and so I don't know if there's a shift going on or not as far as what brings it back. Well, that's, that's, that, that's, um, uh, I couldn't predict that to be honest. Well, uh, John, your thoughts on this topic? I, I think, I think the basic problem is that, you know, when, when you and I started brewing, we were brewing because we couldn't get the beer we wanted to drink. Now that's not the case. I mean, you you know, there's a every town has a has one or two breweries in it these days. Seems like, um, and you can generally buy you know craft beer at the grocery store. So there's not that incentive to brew for your own consumption. It, I think today's homebrew market is made up more of you know the the active do-it-yourselfer. You know the the gourmet chef, the leather worker, the you know the the equipment guy builder that, guy that makes his own knives in his house. Right, John. Yeah. Yeah. That <laughs> kind of, for those that don't know, John's got a foundry <laughs> in his home. So <laughs> he's a bit of a metallurgist but, as well. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's, that's part of it. Um, the, and maybe we, maybe our population is shifting to more urban where we don't, we've, you know, more apartment brewers brewing on smaller equipment. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's, I think it's kind of just shifting in demographics as well as, um, you know, the kind the, the, the need to brew at home versus what it was 25 years ago. Yeah. I know the AHA does surveys and there, you know, there's still a fair number, fairly large number of active brewers, but it seems like they're brewing less is what they kind of concluded from the, from at least from the industry surveys. So, um, yeah, yeah. And we're getting older. <laughs> well, I'm not sure. Actually, I don't know if the whole demographic's getting that much older. Actually, uh, there's still a lot of young folks that do brew beer. So, 
Yeah. Um, yeah. We just happen to be getting older, but, the three of us. It, but. Within homebrew clubs, what, what you always see is, is young people getting involved, and then they have kids. So they're gone for a while. Yeah. And yeah. then maybe they come back. Um, so, so there's been a cyclical aspect to it. And I'm sure the people who want to sell homebrew supplies and uh, want to sell software um, need to find ways to promote uh, young people living in apartments, maybe brewing in smaller batch sizes um, than yeah. th that continue to ha have a, um, a need for this. It, uh, an example would be Yakima Chief is certainly continues to promote their hops uh, to home brewers. And of course it helps uh, if people are suddenly using a, an ounce per gallon. Uh, but <laughs> Or, the, the, or 13 the, the, ounces for a bad trade for right. dry hop. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but it's an important, and, and, and I, for, I would have to look, and it'd be around here somewhere. Um, it's like 10% of their business are, uh, are homebrew. It's, it's incredibly high, surprisingly high. Hmm. That's yeah. Of good. course, some of that might be that the commercial breweries that didn't have contracts for Citro would go to homebrew shops and just buy up everything. Um, and it's really, I, I did talk to a brewery and I forget the first time they did a beer with mosaic. And so it's like a 10 barrel batch and they had to cut open like 4,000 one ounce bags. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I was actually surprised. I was at the homebrew shop the other day and they did say a large number of their, uh, you know, a large number of their sales now are people from the pro brewer, brewer shop, the small pro brewer shops walking in and buying stuff. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, yeah. Um, well, the other big topic I wanted to talk about just here at the end is uh, your thoughts on the IPA craze. Uh, is it is it going to end, uh, and what comes afterwards? Uh, we'll start with you, John. Um, I think the hop growers certainly hope it doesn't end. Uh, they <laughs> they like they like supplying it. Um, in fact, I think in that light, I mean there. Um, I asked a question to the growers panel while I was there this past weekend, and I asked, you know, is there any hop characteristic, you know, that kind of conflicts with, say, hop agronomy, you know, their ability to grow hops? And they said, no, that actually the the new varieties the that are being have been developed over the years and are continuing to be developed. Uh, have really supported this. I mean, you know, increases in percent alpha, increases in oil, increases in in hop character in terms of their flavor and aroma profiles. All of this has been kind of keeping pace, and um, even their ability to adapt to warmer environments has been kind of keeping pace as a result. So, um, I think. Because IPAs or let's say hop forward beers um, offer new flavors to the public, um, I think the hop growers are going to keep promoting them, the hop sellers are going to keep promoting them, and uh, brewers are going to keep promoting them. So I, th I think it'll keep going. Yeah. How about you, Stan? Well, nothing's going to go away until it goes away. Uh, Porter was never going to go away. Right, mild, right. mild was never going to go away. Um, flavorful Pilsner was never going away until we came up with much lighter beers. Uh, full flavored uh, international lagers were never going to go away. And now they're totally squeezed. There's light beer and there's bigger beer. So Things do change eventually, but it is hard to envision, as John pointed out, you do get many unique aromas and flavors. But it's also worth pointing out that IPA is not the most popular beer style in the country, that it takes, in addition, not just IPA, but all the sales of like the 10 largest craft breweries in the country to equal the sales of Michelob Ultra. Yeah, that's true. Um, and uh, craft beer sales are still what, like 10, 15% overall? 
I mean, uh, and it's not much. Yeah, it's it's less than fifteen percent. Um, it's really tricky because it's what do you call craft beer anymore? Because you, you the, the people that are no longer classified as craft. Um, in addition, of course, uh, you've got uh, how do you factor? Everybody's talking about uh, it's called white claw, white or white oh, yeah. claws. The that hard the seltzer. seltzer. And I, I saw and I, I saw I, that I, it's brewed as beer though. I think most is licensed under a beer uh, license. Well, isn't it's, it? it's a malt beverage. Yeah. Um, so it becomes a competitor. Uh, so h- how do you know? And that's that's a flavor that people like, but they don't like too much flavor. So all of these things are factors uh, to return to the IPA or just hop forward beers. Certainly, you know, to, I think the hop farmers need to be paying attention that they don't end up with too many acres in the ground. But it's also worth pointing out that what has been going on here is going on in, in more countries internationally. Uh, you, you go to Brazil and basically you're, you're among the specialty beer bars. Your choices are any amount of haziness of IPA and pastry stout um, and maybe a sour beer. Um, you go to Poland, same thing. So there's, you know, the, the, you still got a world uh, uh, to sell to if you're a hot farmer. Interesting. Well, uh, guys, we're actually coming out to the end of the time here, but I wanted to thank you uh, for coming on episode number 200. Uh, John Palmer, thank you for being here. Great pleasure. Thanks a lot. Great to be here. And my good friend, Stan. Thank you. I sure look forward to doing 10 of the next 200 as well. That'd be great. Yeah. Uh, and my guests today were uh, John Palmer, the author of How to Brew at uh, howtobrew.com, and Stan Hieronymus, the author of uh, the Hops book, as well as Brew Like a Monk. And Stan, I forgot uh, your website. Uh, Appalachianbeer.com. A- Appalachian. E L L A T I O N beer.com. So you, you picked it. Spelled in Hieronymus. Easy, to, easy, easy to spell. Yeah, that's good. You should have just said hieronymusbeer.com or something like that. Yeah. Uh, it's great to have you guys both on the show. Thanks again, John. And uh, thank you, Stan. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you to John Palmer and Stan Hieronymus for joining me this week. Thanks also to our sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine and Blickman Engineering for their years of support for the Beersmith Podcast. And finally, thanks to you, the listeners, for making 200 episodes of the Beersmith Podcast possible. I hope you stick around for episode number 300 in a few years. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm-hmm.